everybody. It's Monday, December 26, 2022. Welcome to the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by Subway. Try the Subway Series menu, your pick of 12 irresistible subs. It's me, your man, MG Marcus Grant, joined by Michael F. Florio and the specialist cast of dozens that was put on this show each and every day, each and every week. And uh, Florio, how was your Christmas, sir? It was really nice. Uh, went by a couple of friends which is always nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we all brought some food, and then we ordered Chinese food for dinner. We watched Christmas movies. It was a good time. All right. Sounds a little bit like mine. I uh, had, had some family stop by the house. We ordered a bunch of Chinese food to just graze on during the day and kind of alternated between some football and some basketball. That was, Sounds uh, like a good day. That was kind of the whole day. So we will kind of go over what happened over the weekend. A little bit odd with most of the games on Saturday and a handful of games on Sunday, but we have our five biggest takeaways, as we always do. We got waiver wire targets for those of you who have made it through or are expecting to make it through to championship weekend, plus Madden Movers. And we're going to have a first round mock draft in case your season is over. We can start looking ahead to next year and uh, maybe there'll be some surprises in the first round. Who knows? But let's start, as we always do, with some fantasy headlines. Starting in Washington, where Taylor Heineke was benched for Carson Wentz during Saturday's loss to the 49ers. The benching came after two consecutive turnovers by Heineke in the fourth quarter. Wentz played the final two drives of the game, going 12 of 16 for Buck 23 and a touchdown head coach Ron Rivera said after the game he isn't sure yet if the move is permanent and that he will name a starter later this week so just to play devil's advocate if it is Carson Wentz that gets the starting job back how do you feel about the rest of this Washington offense not as great I I, the thing is with Taylor Heineke like he was selling shirts that says Terry's down there somewhere (laughs) and that's what we loved about Taylor Heineke is he was getting the most out of Terry McLaurin the best player in this offense I believe it was every game but one that Carson Wentz has started that Curtis Samuel was the top target. And in that one, I think he tied with Terry McLaurin. So like Curtis Samuel gets a boost here. I think it's a downgrade for McLaurin and Jahan Dotson though. See, I was gonna say, I definitely think Samuel gets a boost. I weirdly think Dotson might might keep some value. I think the ceiling stays high. The floor gets a little bit more unstable just because Wentz is gonna throw some YOLO balls. And I think that Mm -hmm. potentially helps Dotson. I do think McLaurin takes a big hit, though, because early in the season when it was Carson Wentz, we didn't see much of Terry McLaurin in this offense at all. So that is very much concerning. Would you start Wentz, say, like a 2QB league against the Browns? It would depend on options. I, he's not <laughs> even like a guaranteed start in two quarterback leagues, I don't think. That's, see, that's the other question, too. Like, I don't know that I would touch him. But neither is Taylor Heineke, really. Yeah, that's probably fair. That's probably fair. So, yeah, I don't know. Take a look at your options. We'll, well, I'm sure we'll talk waiver wire. Maybe his name will appear. I, I, have, I make no guarantees there. <laughs> quarterback news in New York. Mike White has been cleared by doctors. He will start at quarterback for the Jets on Sunday against the Seahawks. New York in a bit of a slump, and Zach Wilson looked absolutely awful on Thursday night. White's been dealing with a rib injury, and now with him back under center, would you start any Jets in championship week? Yeah, I think definitely think Garrett Wilson is back in play. He was being he was awesome every week that Zach Wilson really hasn't started I think Elijah Moore becomes a a little bit of a deeper sleeper I don't love the running backs here they're splitting work they're splitting uh targets and snaps so but I do think Bam Knight is more appealing with Mike White than he is with Zach Wilson all of the Jets I think get a boost even Mike White himself would be in play as a streaming option particularly in two quarterback leagues or maybe you're just going a little bit deeper in a one yeah would not mind starting uh Zach or uh, Mike White rather since Zach Wilson's not going to be there and I like all the receivers that you mentioned Uh, Elijah Moore Garrett Wilson for sure back in play there so that gives us a little bit more hope a little bit more optimism I mean they look decent with Chris Strebler at quarterback at least they looked better than with Zach Wilson at quarterback which probably says a lot about how Wilson's been playing this year time for our five biggest takeaways of the week the five things we learned just by watching foosball for you what was the first thing George Kittle League winner. Like, it's been an up and down year for George Kittle. There were stretches where we were like, all right, this is the George Kittle of old that we drafted. There were stretches where it was like, man, can we even trust George Kittle? Like, the three weeks before these last two hot games, he was in under seven fantasy points in all three of them. But with no Debo Samuel, he is going to win people championships. He had 25 fantasy points last week, 30 this past week, two touchdowns in each of them, over 90 yards in each. 
and they're just designing a lot of plays for him where he could get the ball quickly and do what he does after the catch, which is similar to how they were using Debo Samuel, and he finishes out the, the fantasy season next week in a great matchup against the Raiders. Obviously, you're starting him, but I think he's going to win a lot of people championships. It's interesting because with a couple of key pieces out, namely Debo Samuel, we have seen the Niners go to some of those other guys that kind of work in the inter intermediate parts of the field. Brock Purdy looking more confident. So that's been good things for George Kittle recently. For me, Tua Tonga Vailoa tanked your season. I didn't mean to have alliteration there. It just sort of worked out that way. And you look at Tua, we talked about him in the middle of the season when he was hot. He went three straight games with over 20 points. Then the bye happened in week 11, and he has been completely different since the bye. Since then, just a couple of games with multiple touchdown passes. He's only had more than 18 points once, and that was last week in Buffalo in that cold kind of snowy game they had up there. Then on Sunday, just absolutely imploded in the fourth quarter, three interceptions on three straight possessions to end that game against Green Bay. And so for as great as Tua was in the middle of the season, when we thought maybe he could really push you to a championship, he has sort of done the opposite. And he's kind of been an anchor, giving you about you know 10 to 15 points a game most uh, most weeks. And that's not gonna be enough to get your, your championship run done. I guess it's done, just not in the way you wanted it to be, <laughs> potentially. Uh, anything else that you found out this weekend? Some people whose championship run might be done are those who started Justin Fields. And maybe not. It's me. I'm, I'm one of them. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm very much so on the fence right now in a Justin Fields league. I had Kittle and James Conner bail me out. But Justin Fields showed us that he is human this week. Fewer than 10 fantasy points for the first time in months. Uh, he had been averaging like over 25 fantasy points per game in his prior eight games just 11 rushing yards and only seven rushing attempts and this is a concern of mine because i mean obviously i watched a lot of this game it being against the bills but i couldn't tell if this was just justin field struggling to run because the bills were closing in all of his running lanes pretty quickly or if this is the bears being like hey we're out of it this year. We don't want you taking any more unnecessary hits. So try to dial back the running because only seven rushing attempts. This is a guy who was averaging over 100 rushing yards per game in the last two months coming into this week. So I think obviously if you survive this week with Justin Fields, you still start him. But I'm a little bit more worried now than I was a week ago. Especially on a day that was really cold and really windy, you would think that they would have dialed up some more rushing attempts for Justin Fields. I will say this. I... Fields is not the only reason that my team is probably going to get bounced. I had a lot of underperformance. Stefan Diggs, mm -hmm. uh, a whole lot of guys just really sort of came up short. Justin Fields was just one of them, so I can't put it all on him that I'm not moving on. Uh, for me, Devonta Smith, he is a wide receiver one next year. And we came into the season wondering whether or not Jalen Hurts was going to be able to sustain multiple passers. And yeah, I, I know, Gardner Minshew. But the point being, we didn't know if the Eagles offense could sustain multiple pass catchers and whether or not it was just going to be the A.J. Brown show. And yes, we've had a lot of A.J. Brown. He has been awesome this year, but so has Devonta Smith. And it's to the point that right now he is actually a top 10 wide receiver. He's your wide receiver nine as we sit here. But I don't think this is a fluke. I don't think it's just because of a couple of huge blow up games. I think this is going to be who he is. Yes, there's always volatility at wide receiver. That's the nature of the position. But Devontae Smith in that Philly offense, I think he should be drafted as a top 10, uh, certainly top 12 receiver. We're talking about drafts next year. Last thing that you, I'm, I'm looking at this. I don't, I don't hate it, but I didn't think we'd be saying this at any point this year. I had to put like three question marks at the end of it, but it's Cam Akers league winner. Like a bunch of question marks because that's kind of how he's been playing as of late. He's the RB1 in week 16 right now with nearly 35 fantasy points. He scored three touchdowns the week before he had 13 points. He's been on a stretch though the last month where like he's been a very useful RB2 or flex option. And I mean, yesterday he gave you literally the RB1 numbers. And I'm guessing there's a lot of teams out there that either went zero RB or they were dealing with injuries and, and they were weak at running back. And they were like, you know what? I'm going to pick up Cam Akers and plug him in and see what I get. He's got a couple of good matchups. He's given you 19, 9.3, 13, 34.7 in the last month. Like he's, there's definitely teams that are going to the championship game on the back of Cam Akers right now. He has been, I said it last week, he is the best remaining playmaker in that offense. And you also kind of wonder, Look, it's been a full year now that he's returned, basically, since his Achilles injury. Last year, he wasn't great in the playoffs. He wasn't great this year. Maybe it's just that he's 
finally getting healthy too yeah. after a it, full calendar year. I mean, the, the more time off he gets, the better. So it's very believable that the this is now the real Cam Akers. So we will see what happens next week. But it looks like the Rams might lean on him for the foreseeable future. Time for a break. We come back. We'll go through some of the top performers and some of the biggest disappointments of the week. The highs and lows of week 16 next on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. Week 16's top performers, Dak Prescott in a big win over the Eagles, goes for 28 fantasy points. Cam Akers, we talked about the huge game, 118 on the ground, three rushing touchdowns, nearly 35 points for him. C.D. Lamb did big things on over the weekend, uh, 34 points there. T.J. Hawkinson had a pretty Merry Christmas weekend with nearly 36 points. Matt Gay, three field goals, six extra points. That's good for 19, and the Rams' defense just mauled the Broncos. Six sacks, four picks. And a touchdown good for 21 points there. Let's talk about some of these top performers, though. TJ Hawkinson was pretty good in Detroit. He has leveled up going to Minnesota. About three more targets per game for him. And, you know, I think we all sort of agree he really had league-winning potential in the playoffs. He's really shown it these last couple of weeks. Yeah, I think he uh, he definitely needs to join that elite convert like Travis Kelsey's in his own tier but the secondary tier which is still kind of elite at tight end like Hawkinson is firmly in that you can put him in there with Goddard uh with George Kittle any of the tight ends that you like is that you know right behind Mark Andrews right behind him I think uh, TJ Hawkinson next season in drafts deserves to be in that and obviously if you have him now, you're probably moving on to next week and, and you're starting TJ Hawkinson. They're definitely starting TJ Hawkinson. It will be interesting next year, I think, when you've got Justin Jefferson, maybe Hawkinson as your number two target as they're starting to phase Adam Thielen out. C.D. Lamb came up huge, and I know there was a lot of talk over the weekend about the Eagles against slot receivers, and I know some folks might have thought Noah Brown was a deep sleeper. Turns out the Cowboys were just going to move C.D. Lamb in there and feed him, and that seems like a winning formula. I guess this is just a reminder that C.D. Lamb is good at football. Yeah, against the toughest secondary in football, he is the wide receiver one on the week. Look, you already know that you start C.D. Lamb each and every week, but now on Thursday Night Football, he gets the Titans who have allowed the most fantasy points to, to receivers, the most production on deep passes. C.D. Lamb, another one of those players that if you had him this week, he like I have him in a league or two, he, he carried me to the championship round. I'm hoping he could just get me over the top again next week. At the start of the year, he was my dark horse to be the wide receiver one. That getting hurt sort of put a wrench in that. But this is just, again, this is flashes of why I believe that could have been the case. Uh, let's see. We have Deontay Foreman. as it, And I, I took a pause because I all week long I was like, don't start Deontay Foreman. It's going to be a bad situation. Me too. And then <laughs> in the first half, the Panthers just trampled the Lions. Uh, Foreman finishes with 165 rushing yards and a touchdown. I don't really know what to make of this because, you know, next week it could be that Foreman gets you like, you know, 45 yards or something like that. But I guess if you if you went against our advice and you started Deontay Foreman, congratulations to you. He's a hard matchup next week against the Bucs. Uh, truth, full disclosure, like before he went off, I was like, oh, I'm probably going to write about him as a sit again next week. And I, I can't do that now. I don't know what happened in this game, man. The Lions went full Lions. Like, the minute everyone starts giving them credit and trusting them, they go back to being who they really are. And, and we were like, yo, they've been shutting down all of these big-name running backs. Look at all these guys. And then Sam Darnold, Chuba Hubbard, and Deontay Foreman combined for over 203 touchdowns in the first. In I don't get it. Half. I don't get it. I just, I'm sorry. I'll take the L. I told people to sit Deontay Foreman. Someone tweeted me and they were like, you told me to sit Deontay Foreman. I better not see you taking any humble brags on <laughs> Fantasy Live this week. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> That's good that they watched the show. Yeah, it was just a swing and a miss. I mean, everything about this matchup seemed bad. I was I was against starting Deontay Foreman this week too. So if you if you sat him because of my advice, I apologize for that. It was just it was just a swing and a miss. That's all there is to it. T. Higgins comes through with a big one. And again, look, we know Jamar Chase is going to get his opportunities there. Uh, I guess the biggest surprise is that the Patriots just – I know they came almost won that game. They came back. But the Patriots' defense got shredded in that first half. Yeah, they did. They made it real interesting down the stretch. But T. Higgins, man, he is – we know that T. Higgins is healthy. He's one of the very best wide receivers in football. Uh, hopefully, you survived a couple weeks ago when he didn't play a snap and, and you stuck with him. Because if you have, he's been really good in the fantasy playoffs. Uh, 
and then next week next week the Bengals and bills play on monday night football i imagine a bunch of championship games are going to come down to i'm so excited for that game that's going to be a really great monday night game and you're right it's going to it means a lot for nfl playoff seedings it means a ton for fantasy championships because you're going to have so many fantasy relevant players playing in that game on monday night that one is going to be very interesting to watch last one jalen waddle had a big catch and run for a touchdown in that one and uh, five for 143 and a score there. Just a reminder that the Dolphins, even with two of struggles, their wide receivers are must starts every week. Yep, and I know there was a couple of weeks of down performance by uh, Jalen Waddle, and, and we were getting questions like, oh, should I sit Waddle for this person? And I told everyone who asked me about Waddle to start Waddle. Uh, and my logic is the same reason I was behind Tua, and that one kind of swung and missed. But there's just far too much upside in this offense and too much explosiveness. So, like, yeah, next week against the Patriots in the cold weather, blah, 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 you're still starting Jalen Waddle. You're still Waddle. starting Jalen Waddle, just like you'd still be starting Tyreek Hill. They are sort of a 1A, 1B situation there in Miami. So start both those guys. Those are the guys that made us happy. How about the guys who broke our hearts this weekend? Who was one of your big disappointments? <sighs> Ramondre Stevenson. <laughs> I went on Fantasy Live this week and said, sit every Patriot not named Ramondre. And then Ramondre went out and gave you 3.3 fantasy <laughs> points. He had a fumble, nearly had a touchdown. Could, uh, if he didn't fumble the ball, he probably has a touchdown. Um, yeah, it was just as good as he was the week before, which was the week where we didn't know if he was going to play or not. And then if you trusted him, he ended up going off for you, giving you over 20 fantasy points. As good as he was that week, he was bad this week. I, in one league with Ramondre, got bumped in one. I'm hoping to survive. And the thing is, they get uh, next week the Dolphins in New England. Like, you're going to go back for more Ramondre. You're going to go back for more Ramondre. The matchup's good, and he's still getting so much volume, but that one definitely hurt. Speaking of things that hurt, Devontae Adams being shut down again. And I don't know if it's completely Devontae or if it's just that the Raiders just don't seem to be able to get him the ball very easily. Two catches for 15 yards. The nine targets was nice, but they, it just it just was hard. You see there, Derek Carr sort of airmailing throws, just not able to get him the ball regularly or in spaces where he can do things with it. And it just is weird that the Raiders seem to have a habit of this. Here it is. You traded for arguably the best receiver in the league. You, you threw the bag at him afterwards to keep him there. And it just seems like you struggle to integrate him into the offense on a regular basis. And I get it. The weather was not great. But you saw Kenny Pickett able to get George Pickens involved. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand it. it. It's frustrating. And I'm sure it, it really killed a lot of fantasy managers this week. Uh, and you have another receiver who... We let us down. <laughs> uh, yeah, Stephon Diggs. Um, in the Fantasy Live League, I have Ramondre Fields and Stephon Diggs. That was not not a very fun Saturday afternoon watching these games. And Stephon Diggs caught both of his targets for 26 yards, and that was it. And, yeah, you could say this is one bad game, but this has been a trend as of late. He hasn't had double-digit targets in a month. Uh, in two of those games in the last month, he has five targets or less routinely it feels like Diggs is on the sideline going up to McDermott and Allen and being like give me the ball like I am your best player I don't understand why they are routinely taking away their best player and throwing the ball to like Isaiah McKenzie but that's what they're doing right now and you're still starting Stefan Diggs next week but I'm definitely way more worried than anticipated I know that's already a question that that we're getting is should people be sitting Stefan Diggs I can't in good conscience say you're sitting him but it's definitely been frustrating also frustrating watching Aaron Jones on Sunday against the Miami Dolphins last week both Jones and AJ Dillon had really nice games against that Rams defense felt like they could do something similar against the Miami defense that has struggled against the run all season long but Six carries, just two receptions, just not a lot of usage for Aaron Jones in that game. And one in which the Packers sort of had to hang on to win. If it wasn't for the three interceptions that Tua threw in the second half, who knows? Maybe Miami wins that game. I just expected you'd see more usage out of Aaron Jones. And it was it was frustrating because the matchup was good. And he's one of their best playmakers, arguably. A.J. Dillon's been getting more work than him lately. I, I don't really get it. It's it's so confusing because there's just no consistency yeah. to how they're using their backs there in Green Bay. For those of you who made it on to Championship Weekend, or at least expecting to make it through, pending what happens on Monday nights, we'll help you out in case you needed to refresh your lineup. We'll talk some waiver wire picks next on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. It's time for Refresh Your Lineup, presented by Subway. Let's take a look, Mike, at your top waiver wire targets for Week 17. 
Daniel Jones in play as a streamer against the Colts. Brock Purdy continues to be a streaming option, gets a good matchup against the Raiders. Gardner Minshew in play if Jalen Hurts once again sits. Tyler Algier with a great matchup. He's the running back that I want to start from Atlanta right now. Chuba Hubbard's been getting more work. And James Cook has also been getting some more work if you're going a little bit deeper at running back. Some receivers, DJ Chark in a good matchup against the Bears. Definitely a streaming option. Jahan Dotson, quarterback's up in the air, but he's still in play if you need a streamer. So are the Giants, guys. Isaiah Hodgins has been red hot. Richie James getting action out of the slot. And then the only tight end, because unless you're streaming a tight end, you shouldn't be looking to pick any up this week with just one <laughs> week to go. Tyler Higby, though, very much so in play after what he just did yesterday against the Broncos. I was already, you know, we, we put this doc together. We were sort of filling things in on Saturday and uh, you'll talk about the players to drop but I, I originally had Tyler Higby in there and then the Rams <laughs> game happened I'm like I guess you can't really drop Tyler Higby after he scores a couple I, of I had him as a sit as an early sit candidate yeah too. <laughs> by the way if you want more waiver wire names you can always check out Matt Okada's weekly waiver wire column nfl.com slash waiver wire it's just that easy but let's talk about some of the names on the list Brock Purdy and I was sort of so-so on Brock Purdy this week, and he's never given you huge numbers, right? Like, you're not going to start Brock Purdy and get 25 fantasy points out of him. But 16, he's minimizing the turnovers. He's playing decent football, and, like, he's, he's definitely worth a start in two QB leagues. I'll say that. Yeah, for sure. And I think if you've been streaming quarterback, and I, I think there are a lot of people out there who have, like if you lost Jalen Hurts or Kyler Murray, you could have been comfortably in the playoffs. Brock Purdy, you could do a lot worse than him next week against the Raiders who have given up a bunch of production through the passing game. Like, I, I do agree. I think the floor, probably around 15, 16. But in this good matchup, I think he has the chance to, to sit somewhere around 20 fantasy points. And if you're getting that out of a streamer, I think you'll be very happy. Raiders just gave up a game-winning drive to Kenny Pickett in sub-zero temperatures. <laughs> so, uh, Brock Purdy definitely in play. Tyler Algier, we talked about him a little bit. He's getting more work. They're sort of, I won't say phasing Cordero Patterson out, but they're certainly increasing what Algier does. We know they want to run the football, and so if you if you need a running back, you need to flex, maybe he's a guy you look at this week. Yeah, I, I would definitely be picking him up, and I think he is the top streaming running back option this week. He had 18 carries this past week. Uh, Patterson just had eight. He played more snaps than Patterson did, plus... He was used in the pass game a bit. Patterson only had one target. We saw five go to Tyler Algier. Not only is he getting more volume now, he's also much more explosive. He's the back that they use near the goal line at times. I think Cordero Patterson is droppable. And meanwhile, Tyler Algier is someone that you could start in a good matchup this week. Very curious to see next year sort of how the Falcons operate. Is it heavy Algier? What happens with Cordero Patterson? And this might be a chance to kind of showcase himself for the 2023 season. Jahan Dotson, we talked about what uh, maybe a return to Carson Wentz would mean. At least yesterday, though, in fact, the last couple weeks, Jahan Dotson's kind of come back to life after a long stretch of nothingness. Yeah, a, a touchdown in three straight games. The low is 54 yards, the high is 105. But what I love is at least six targets in each game, nine and two of those last three. So he's a receiver who could win downfield. He could win in the end zone. He just needs volume. Uh, I feel a little bit more confident in the volume if it's Taylor Heineke out there because we do know that Carson Wentz likes Curtis Samuel more. But either way, I think if you're going for a streaming option at wide receiver, Jahan Dotson is in play this week. Very much in play. And I know the dynasty folks are starting to buzz again that maybe the buy low window is closing on Jahan Dotson. That is for you guys to argue about. Uh, Isaiah Hodgins. Now, last week, Cynthia Freeland was big on Isaiah Hodgins. She got Adam Rank on board the hype train, and it paid off this past week. Yeah, I was going to say kudos to Cynthia Freeland, who was on this very early last week. I, I liked Darius Slayton a lot. He had a so-so game, but it was Hodgins that had the game that I really thought Slayton would have. 11 targets, 8 catches, 89 yards, and a touchdown. He's barely leaving the field playing 90% of the snaps every single week. The targets have been a little up and down, but at least 6 in 3 of his last 4 games. And he has a touchdown in all 3 games with at least 6 targets. So next week against the Colts in a game that I think will be competitive, even the Giants... It's a big, big game for the Giants, mm -hmm. so I don't expect them to take their foot off the gas even if they have a lead. I think Hodges is in play if you're going a little deeper. Suddenly, we're getting Giants receivers in the mix here late in the season. James Cook's starting to get more in the mix for the Bills. He's kind of been in and out of it, but the last few weeks... 
fast. He's been very much involved. And I guess I like the fact that it kind of come down to a two-man backfield goal there in Buffalo. It's been a little bit yeah. easier to figure now that it's just Singletary and Cook. Both those guys had good games, but Cook has a ton of uh, receiving upside too. The, the usage isn't what you want it to be for James Cook. Devin Singletary is still the lead runner. It, it, there's some games where like James Cook will split or even get the, the majority of touches. And then there's others where he kind of just disappears. But there's so much upside here because he's explosive. We saw him break out a long one the other day. Like you said, he could get used in the passing game. So he's not someone I think you just pick up and start. But like if you need someone, maybe someone got hurt or something like that. If you need to grab someone off the waiver wire and plug in your lineup, he at least brings upside. That's kind of what we like there, especially this time of year. You're looking for those upside plays, which actually gets us to the players you can drop. So if you are adding people, you probably need to make some room. Guys with no upside probably go back to the waiver wire. Who are you looking at? Adam Thielen, who right now at best is the third target in Minnesota. He's behind Justin Jefferson, TJ Hawkinson, and then he has to compete with Dalvin Cook and KJ Osborne for targets. There's just not a lot of upside there. Pretty much anyone you're not starting this week can be dropped. As long as your opponent can't use that player, you can drop them. So uh, if you need a defense, a kicker, maybe you want to block your opponent, everything is in play this week. You don't, there's literally no tomorrow, so you don't need depth anymore. <laughs> this is really it. Like, you know, I'm sure we're going to get some, hey, this is a do or die week for me. Yeah, it is for everybody, <laughs> man. It's the championships. So along those lines, Kareem Hunt or any of your handcuff running backs, as long as your starter, as long as the starter on that team is a go. There's no point of hanging on to the Kareem Hunts of the world. He's just not getting enough usage. That means, you know, let's say a Jalen Warren in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and Amir Abdullah for the Raiders. Y you, you get where I'm going with this. All these guys that you're holding on to as insurance policies, there's no need for insurance in this final week. You are playing the guys that you are playing, and there's no need to look ahead to what's going to come beyond that. I mean, I was in one of those weird, we play week 18 leagues for the points. Don't do that. Stop doing that. But anyway, uh, Kareem Hunt, you probably go back to the waiver wire at this point. Fair? Fair. That was Bye -bye. me being an umpire. Back. <laughs> You're out of here. Uh, you know, I almost got tossed from a baseball game I wasn't even playing in. That's a different story for a different show. <laughs> You know, in case you did not make your fantasy playoffs and you're looking ahead to next year, we're going to help you out. We're going to come back after the break and have a first round mock draft. Our first one is way, way too early. and It's probably going to look very different by the time we get to August. But stick around for that on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. Lofts it. It's a touchdown. He straight up sliced them. Justin Jefferson put it in. Oh, my goodness. This is Eckler. Eckler breaking free. Trying to fight his way in. Still going. And he is in. Here's a deep ball. Watch Hill. Perfectly dropped in. Touchdown, Dolphins. The cap Those are some of the top players in fantasy football in 2022. And that makes, lets us spin ahead to 2023 and start thinking about some mock drafts here. Uh, it's still a little ways away before we're doing this for real, but you know, let's, let's figure out what things might look like at this point in the season. So, we have a 10 team first round mock draft. Florian and I sort of alternate picks because, I mean, it's just the two of us here. So, the number one overall pick in 2023, where are you going? Austin Eckler. Look, last season he was the RB2. Right now, currently he's the RB2. He's one point, less than a point behind Christian McCaffrey, but he still plays tonight, so he'll probably have a, have a good lead going on, on into week 17 as the RB1. He's doing it right now because of the same way he always does it, right? Catches. He, he's not going to have a, a blow you away with his rushing yards, but at the end of the year, he's going to potentially lead the position in total yards because of what he gives you as a receiver. Then he's their, their goal line weapon that they just go to all the time. RB2 last year, looking like a RB1 finish right now. I know people always want the shiny new toy, but at some point, we just got to be like, hey, this guy right now is, is, if he's not the very best, he's one of like the top two or three at his position, and he's very consistent. The consistency and the high ceiling is what gives him the shot at being number one. It's also 
why I felt comfortable taking Christian McCaffrey at number two. And we came into the year looking at McCaffrey as a guy who was going to dominate the snaps with whatever roster he was on at that time. It was the Carolina Panthers. He was going to get loaded up with touches, get loaded up with receptions. Now, that changed a little bit when he got to San Francisco and they had so many weapons that we saw his opportunities sort of scale back a little bit. But... In the last couple of weeks, with no Jimmy Garoppolo, no Debo Samuel, he's back to being that guy playing 90% of the snaps and getting overloaded with touches. Now, next year, it could be sort of what we saw a few weeks ago. But the fact is, his ceiling remains as high as anybody in the game. The floor is about as stable. He can beat you in any number of ways. He can catch touchdowns. He'll run for touchdowns. He's even thrown a touchdown this year. That's how good he has been. So I think you're crazy if you somehow let McCaffrey get outside the top three in your fantasy leagues next year. Speaking of three, who do you take at that spot? At number three, I'm going to take the first wide receiver off the board in Justin Jefferson. And I will not be surprised at all if come this you know August, if he's going consistently as the number one player off the board. Right now, he's not only the wide receiver one on the season, he is just under 360 fantasy points in PPR leagues. One other player receiver has over 300 fantasy points. No one has over 330. So he is more than a full game's worth of points ahead of the wide receiver two, which is Tyreek Hill. And nearly three games ahead, or even more than that, using their, their averages ahead of Stephon Diggs, who's the wide receiver three right now. And he's only getting better. That's the scary part. Like he's finally, we coming into this year, we were like, all right, He's finally in an offense with an offensive minded head coach who's going to throw the ball, who's going to look to get the most out of him. And in weeks with two more regular seasons to go, he already broke Randy Moss's Vikings single season receiving yards record. He might get to 2000 like he's less than 250 yards away. I think the Vikings are really going to push for him to be the first one to get to 2000. I saw something that said if he gets to 2,000 and the Vikings finishes the two seed, he should be in the MVP discussion, and I fully agree. <laughs> I definitely agree, and I remember at the Pro Bowl last year, I asked him who would get to 2,000 yards first in a season, him or Jamar Chase, and he was like, me, without a doubt. I didn't think it'd be this year, but, but here we are. As you mentioned, less than 250 yards away from that. You also mentioned that there's only one other wide receiver with more than 300 fantasy points this season. I'm going to take him at number four. It's Tyreek Hill. And he got to Miami, and we wondered, well, how is it going to be now that he's not catching passes from Tua Tungavailoa? And you know, Tyreek himself made the statement about Tyreek throws a great ball, and he's so happy, and everybody kind of roasted him. And look, yes, Tua Tungavailoa is not Patrick Mahomes. But man, it hasn't really slowed Tyreek Hill down at all. He's at 1,600 yards. And for a while, it looked like he might be on pace for a 2,000-yard season. That's going to be tough over the next couple of weeks. But then again, if it's Tyreek Hill, would you actually doubt him? Uh, the way he's getting targets, the way he's making plays, both he and Jalen Waddle are terrorizing defenses right now. You just put the ball in his hands and a big play is waiting to happen. Uh, you want to talk about just having a competitive advantage on your roster. Having Tyreek Hill pretty much gives you that. So... Speaking of having competitive advantages by picking one specific player, who'd you take at number five? The biggest advantage by taking one, at least in my opinion, but one specific player, no one gives you a bigger advantage than Travis Kelsey. He doesn't have 300 fantasy points yet. He's at 295, but if he was a wide receiver, he would be the wide receiver three right now behind only Jefferson and Tyreek Hill. But here's the real crazy part. He has 295 fantasy points. No other tight end has 200. <laughs> no, only TJ Hawkinson is within a hundred fantasy points of him. The tight end three, who's Mark Andrews right now, is over 120 fantasy points behind Travis Kelsey. Using the other tight ends per game averages, that it would take uh, Mark Andrews an additional 10 games just to get caught up to Travis Kelsey right now. Like he is the ultimate cheat code. He is the over seven fantasy points more than the net per game or just around seven than the next closest. That's a touchdown plus the catch, the point for the catch. <laughs> such an advantage you right talk now. about the gap between travis kelsey and mark andrews right it's about 124 points approximately that's as big about as the gap between mark andrews at three and like the tight end 43 oh my 
God. <laughs> that is that is how big that gap is for Travis Kelsey. I mean, it has been the hugest single person advantage we, in fantasy. We might see articles in the summer like take Travis Kelsey one overall, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't even be mad about it. I think it's going to be a discussion point. Now, we'll see how we settle on it, but I think that conversation is going to happen because, I mean, it's the offseason. A lot of weird things happen. <laughs> uh, number six, and maybe this feels a little bit strange after we talked about this player as being a disappointment this past week. But overall, Stefan Diggs continues to be an advantage for folks. He tends to give you a leg up on a week-to-week basis. Yes, the last few weeks have been a little bit down, but this is still one of the more dynamic, high-powered offenses in the league. And Stefan Diggs is still the number one option in Buffalo's passing game. So even though the floor has been unstable in recent weeks, the ceiling remains high. Any given week, you can still see a big blow-up game for Stefan Diggs. He's given you double-digit touchdowns this year, over 1,300 yards, very much in play to get you to 1,500 yards, over 100 receptions. He is still far and away one of the more elite players at this position in the NFL. And even if the last month has left a bad taste in your mouth, I think you'll be able to sort of forget a lot of that by the time we get to the end of next summer. So, Stefan Diggs goes at number six. And at this point, we've got three receivers off the board. We have gone four straight pass catchers here. Do you go back to a running back at number seven? Nope. I think <laughs> I think this is going to be a trend next year. I think with the first round, it's going to be littered with receivers. And I'm going to take, I think right now this season, there's been four elite. The three first elite guys are already up the board. Give me the one remaining one in Devontae Adams. Now, I know he disappointed this past week. I know that Devontae Adams has been more up and down this year with Derek Carr than he has been with Aaron Rodgers in the past. But... He's still putting up elite numbers right now. He's still the wide receiver four on the season. He's given you over almost 1,300 yards right now, still catching a bunch of touchdowns. My only concern and the only thing I think that could knock him lower than this in drafts next season is who's going to be their quarterback because it feels to me like things are going to change in Vegas next year, either whether that be the coach or the quarterback or something. The one thing that will remain consistent is Devontae Adams will be there catching passes from whoever's throwing them. So Devontae Adams comes in at number seven. At number eight, I will get back to the running backs here. And I'm going to take Saquon Barkley. And I was big on the saquon early in the season. Now, he did sort of have a little bit of a speed bump in the middle of the year, but he's still been very good. The usage has been very high. More importantly, he stayed healthy. He has remained explosive. He's very much involved in the passing game. I think it's sort of weird that for all the catches he has, uh, he does not have a receiving touchdown this season, but I think that's sort of uh, more a fluke than anything else. When you look at him, he is actually tied for fifth in with running backs in receptions, but it's just more that we're back to seeing the Saquon we saw his first couple of years again. He's explosive, he's healthy, and he's the focal point of the Giants offense, and I think that's going to be good enough to get him into the first round. Number nine, you want to talk about life comes at you fast. Uh, This guy was on top of the world. This year has sort of knocked him down a few pegs. Yeah, I I said last week when he got hurt that Jonathan Taylor would not be the number one overall pick, but he would still be a first round pick. And that's what we see here. He went at nine overall. And I don't want to knock Jonathan Taylor uh, because I'm a big fan of his. I do think last season when he finishes the RB1, I I think it was the lowest amount of points for an RB1 in like a a few years. It seems like things broke right for him. I still think he's awesome. Maybe not the overall RB1 because of the team around him. We got to see what they do with quarterback, with the offensive line, but still far too much explosiveness. He's improved as a pass catcher. Again, not the overall RB1, but I still think he should be in the top five running back conversation. I just think the talent is too much and the opportunity when he's healthy is going to be enough to keep him in the first round in a lot of leagues. Similarly, rounding out our top 10, and I I had a lot of options here at this, this final spot. I decided to go with Derrick Henry because the king is still the king. You know, El Tractor Cito still doing his thing, had the long touchdown run this past week against the Houston Texans and still is just an absolute battering ram when he gets his hands on the ball and the Titans still building their offense around him all these years later. And you look at Derrick Henry, he's over 1,400 rushing yards, got the double digit touchdowns. This is just what he does. But on top of it, the the receiving numbers are bigger than they have been in the past. 379 receiving yards. They're starting to just occasionally throw him the ball out in space, maybe get a couple of blockers out in front of him. Not that he needs any. 
but you give him some extra help along the sidelines here when you're dealing with defensive backs. It just seems like a big play waiting to happen. So, you know, Derrick Henry, not the lockdown top five pick that he had been earlier in his career, but I just don't really see him falling out of the top five or uh, top 10, I should say, not falling out of the first round in 2023. So looking at it, just a quick recap of uh, our picks. Eckler at one, McCaffrey at two, Justin Jefferson goes three, Tyree Kill at four, Travis Kelsey's at five, Stephon Diggs at six, Devontae Adams at seven, Saquon Barkley eight, Jonathan Taylor nine, Derrick Henry 10. Anybody else that, that might be vying for first round honors that maybe we didn't get in here? Um, I, I don't think any there's any other tight end that belongs in there. I, as much as I want to push a quarterback like Hurts or Allen up or Mahomes, I think round two is probably a better fit for them. I think we got the receivers who go belong there. The one running back that I, I, Josh Jacobs could end up anywhere, I, I'm not really – but Tony Pollard was one that I mm. – him and Ramondre Stevenson were two that I considered strongly but ultimately decided against. Josh Jacobs, I feel like it depends on what his situation is next year. If he's with the Raiders, where he potentially lands, what the offense around him looks like, I think that's going to be impactful on him. You know, But we didn't mention Dalvin Cook. We didn't mention Nick Chubb. Uh, A.J. Brown, Alvin Kamara, Alvin Kamara. Those are names that, that we're used to seeing kind of hovering around that bottom part of the first round. They didn't make it again. This is it's December, right? <laughs> like This is going to change drastically. A, a lot will change, but I do think we're going to see a lot of the usual first round names go more in the second or third. Like all those names that you just said. And uh, I'd add Aaron Jones, Joe Mixon into that group. Like those are going to be what makes up the second and third round, which kind of if, if you could get like a running back like that in like the third round. Even more reason to take a receiver. CD Lamb is the one. Oh, I was just that just popped in my head that I could see making it into the first. CD Lamb could definitely creep in. Uh, last thing you mentioned: second round for quarterbacks, Mahomes, Allen, Hurts, whatever. Who do you think is going to be the consensus number one quarterback this this off season? Hurts. Yeah, agreed. I think it's Jalen Hurts. It's the passing. It's with the rushing. Uh, you know, Josh Allen's definitely in the conversation, but I think Hurts is going to be I, the guy. I think Mahomes will firmly be three. Mm -hmm. I think the debate will be Allen versus Hurts. Which is going to be weird that Patrick Mahomes might end up being a draft bargain <laughs> because he's the third quarterback off the board. It's not a bad guy to have fall to you if that's going to be the case. Of course, we'll do more of these as we go through the offseason, and I'm sure they will change quite a bit between now and, say, July or August. We're almost done here on the show. When we come back, we'll have our Madden Movers for the week, the guys that deserve a little bit of a boost. We'll talk about that next on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. Does this shirt make my arm look small? Your arm is almost unperceivable in that okay, shirt. Okay, I will give him two tutties there, and, uh, you know, that's a, a handy little 21 points. <laughs> Joe Mixon! <laughs> Out of concussion protocol, we were like, shoot off of the... I'm just gonna throw this up. And I don't think I've ever heard the words hot dog eating contest said more in like four sentences than in that voice. Like, except, I, you know, outside of like July 4th at Coney Island. Welcome inside with the insiders. Tom Pelissero, Mike Garofolo, Ian Rappaport. Zach Wilson gonna play again this year. Save this clip. I might be right, I might be wrong. Save it either way. Baker Mayfield might have saved his career last night to go and put on that type of a show under very challenging circumstances. You know, for Daniel Jones, it feels to me like they want him back. Get him out of here! This is the longest goodbye. This is the opposite of an Irish goodbye. Get him out of here! NFL Plus is here, which means no matter where you are, this is how you football. You can stream live, local, and primetime games on your phone or tablet, 45-minute game replays with NFL Plus Premium, and more. This is the NFL for every fan. This is football freedom. This is your game on the go. Go to plus.nfl.com and sign up now. Time for our Monday Madden Movers, the guys that we didn't get to fit anywhere else into the show who deserve a little bit love for their performances. So... Who deserves a Madden ratings boost this week? Shane Zilstra, ah. who, <laughs> who's a 62 <laughs> overall right now on Madden. And he just went out this week. He caught five of his six targets for 26 yards and three touchdowns. He deserves some love after that, a 25.6 fantasy point day. Um, I will say he had more targets in this game than he had in the entire season combined. <laughs> so I, I'm not advocating to start him next week or stream him like that, because especially the Bears have been tough against tight ends. But hey, for one week, I don't know anyone who streamed Shane Zilstra, but if you did, 
kudos to you and just for a week he deserves some love and he deserves a boost in madden most people don't even know who he is i tweeted about shane zilstra and somebody responded you mean brandon i'm like no <laughs> shane the brother shane zilstra so i'm pretty sure no one started him at all kendrick Bourne might have been a guy that some people started maybe out of desperation and this is a guy who's a talented player who just never gets a lot of opportunity Part of it's because the Bengals or uh, the Patriots passing game has been really bad. But against the Bengals, found a way to have himself a day. Six catches for 100 yards and a touchdown. Also 29 rushing yards to help the Patriots nearly come from behind and win. Now, because of the struggles and inconsistency of New England's aerial attack, it's hard to count on Kendrick Bourne week in and week out. I still think Jacoby Myers is maybe the guy that you believe in the most. But... Maybe looking forward, there's something there with Kendrick Bourne? Who knows? He's been around the league a little bit, but had himself a nice day on Sunday, and we should at least recognize that. Who else gets a Madden boost for you this week? Trevor Lawrence, who is a 79 overall right now. He needs to join the 80 club, in my opinion. And this past week, in a super tough matchup against the Jets, whose secondary really kept the Jaguars receivers in check. Uh, it was bad weather out. He still went out and put up good fantasy numbers because of what he gave you with his legs with 51 rushing yards and a rushing touchdown. That is one aspect of his game that I think doesn't get enough love. He is good with his legs. He's mobile and he's very sneaky near the goal line. That was one thing that jumped out at me when he was coming out of college is how great he is at selling the handoff near the goal line and just running it in himself. But he's on a hot streak right now. He finishes up next week uh, against the Houston Texans. I think you continue to just start him every single week if you have him right now. I think Trevor Lawrence, maybe not, you know, like the strongest case for fantasy playoff MVP, but there's definitely a case to be made. Right now, he is the QB5 overall. Would you draft him? Would you draft him as a top five QB next year? Um, I think after after Hurts, Allen, Mahomes, he is in that. I don't know if he'll crack top five, but he's in that next tier. Yeah, I mean, I think it was still like you got Joe Burrow, who's in there. Justin Fields probably going to be hanging Kyle around Mario's there as well. In that group. So he's definitely top ten. Question is, does he get to top five? Gardner Minshew's not going to be a top five quarterback next year, but he deserves some mad love for what he did over the weekend against the Dallas Cowboys. Very nearly got the Eagles to a win. Over 350 passing yards, a couple of touchdowns, ran for a score. I was very hesitant. People asked about Gardner Minshew. I, I, I didn't really get behind him. I was worried. He played well, so I will admit that I, I sort of missed on that one. I didn't think he'd be terrible. I just My fear was that he was going to give you like 14 points and you just weren't going to be able to do much with that. But instead, if you started him, you got a very nice day, nearly 23 fantasy points. And, you know, I tweeted, does he get a Mitch Trubisky-type bag next year when people look and <laughs> he say, should. hey, man, Gardner Minshew can still play. And then he's, you know, I don't know, gets a starting job with some you know, mediocre team, maybe he's starting for the Texans or something. I see year. that. You know, the we'll Colts? See. Colts? Very well could happen. Uh, although I think what's going to happen with the Colts is that you're going to have Zach Wilson backing up Derek Carr in Aww. Indianapolis next year. All right, send Gardner Minshew to the Jets. All right, Gardner, the Gardner. Giants. There's Gardner's personality teams. in New York City would love to see it. I think that'd be fun to watch. In the meantime, we're going to wrap up our Madden Movers. We are also going to wrap up our show. That is it. We are done. We appreciate you hanging out with the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by Subway. Try the Subway Series menu, your pick of 12 irresistible subs. You know the drill. Tell two friends to tell two friends. Rate, review, and remember, there are no bad pictures. It's just how your face looks sometimes. Be safe, take care of yourselves, and we'll talk to you on Wednesday.